Then whenever I was 16, I tried meth. And, oh, I thought, thought I was fat and it was gonna help. You know, I was like, oh, this is gonna help me lose weight. I'll be able to stay up. I can hang out with my mom whenever the other kids are asleep because there's so many. You don't really get one on one time. My mom found out and she's like, what the hell are you doing? What's wrong with you? Because I'm very honest with her, I always was. Anything I was gonna do, I needed her to know just in case something happened. She'd know where I was, who I was with, and what I did. Whether she wanted to hear it or not, she was gonna hear it. Well, I come from a huge family. My family is very close, very tight knit. My mom had eight kids. And we grew up, um, you know, my uncle Louie was a big part of my life, my uncle Bo, they were my dads. My grandpa was my dad. My grandpa did uh, five different prison terms. <laughs> he had 302 tattoos, super cool guy. He was, changed his entire life around and, you know, uh, told us all these cool stories, you know, and you're like, wow, he's a super cool guy. He's traveled all the way across the United States, hitchhiking when it was safe, you know, and then his, his end of the story would be like, you don't want to do that. You know, I'm telling you so you don't do it. He didn't do drugs, um, but he had a hell of a life. You know, he was, and then, you know, his, my uncle, uh, would come over always in these really cool flashy cars and well, he worked at a car lot. So he was car salesman and other things. <laughs> and um, a man of power. Both of my uncles um, were really cool guys. And then my Uncle Bo, you know, was more of the laid back guy and there for you when you needed him. So was Uncle Louie. My mom kind of fell into that pattern and uh, straightened her life out for her kids. I was hanging out with a whole different crowd. My cousin had introduced me to my cousin Renee. And I thought these people, you know, were friends. Renee was really cool. You know, all her friends had really cool cars and you know, she was somebody to look up to, fun, party, you know. In my head as a teenager, that was somebody you wanted to be around. And so, you know, my grandma started no noticing a difference. Shipped me off to live with my aunt and Bonner. She was like, you don't know what the hell's going on, but you're gonna go live with your Aunt Kay. You're gonna stay there for a while. I was like, all right. You know, she's probably right. You know, I probably do need to get my shit together and go. And uh, so I went and stayed with her. But I missed my mom. I missed my grandma. I missed my sisters and brothers, being around them. And then um, I came home sober. You know, I sobered up. 2005, probably. I'm not, I'm not even sure because I... In my head, my mom's been gone five years. I know it's been nine. My grandma's been gone three years, and I know it's, I know it's been 14, you know, so. My grandma passed away, and you know, I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna be strong for her. I had to plan the funeral because she put me down as the beneficiary of everything and I had to delegate where everything went. She was the strongest woman you'd ever meet in your life. She held our families together. And then when she passed away, I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I was working 72 hours a week at Waffle House. I did that for probably 12 years and she babysat and she kept telling me, Amber, you gotta, you gotta cut back on those hours because 
you're missing a lot of important stuff with your kids, you know. Her and our grandpa really, and my mom, really, you know, had a strong faith background regardless of whatever was going on. They made sure we grew up in church and, you know, so I wanted to keep that path with my kids. And um, when she passed away, all of that went out the window. And I was like, you know, I really don't care about anything. I lived with her most of my life just because over there you're the only you're the only kid. There's not seven, well, six at the time others that you got to fight for your mother's attention. It wasn't really like that because she made sure we all felt loved. But I was a spoiled brat, I'm not even going to lie, <laughs> and I needed all of the attention all the time. So when she passed away, I lost all of that. I wasn't the most important thing to one certain person because my mom had to, we were all very important to her, but she had to split that, you know, with everyone. My grandma was supposed to split that with everyone, but I was the first grandkid, and so, ha ha. No, <laughs> I was priority, number one. But when she passed, I kind of just lost it, and you know, I stayed working for a while, and then uh, I wasn't making enough money to get into my own place because I had been living with her. Every time I moved, she was like, oh, you can't do that. You got to come back home, you know, and so I was very codependent on her. And then um, so I thought, you know what, start selling a little bit of this and I won't touch it this time. I'll be OK. I'll be fine. So I sold crack because I knew I never tried crack and I didn't want to do crack because crack is dirty, the crack is gross, you know, in my head. This, you know, there's a whole, I guess, crack was just really gross to me. I didn't want to be a crackhead. When you're addiction, you, in addiction, you think that. Like, you really think that, okay, this is bottom shelf. You don't mess with that, you want to be up here. I started doing that, not doing it, selling it, and I was making enough money. I didn't like that crowd. It was weird. They were blowing my phone up every 20 minutes. Didn't like it. And so I was like, well, we'll just sell Coke. You know, those people won't bother you as much. And it's, yeah, and it's okay. I didn't like that crowd. You know, that's not me. I'm like, oh, my God. Because, you know, I had been out of the scene for a long time. Didn't ever want to do Coke. You know, I didn't want to touch it. So I didn't. My baby brother was like, you're going to go to jail and you got kids. You got to straighten your ass out. You got to stop. So in my head, he meant stop selling hard drugs. So I started selling weed. And, and I was still working, you know. So in my head, I'm doing the right thing. I'm justifying it because that's what you do. And I didn't know how to sell weed. So I wasn't good at it. And I'm all about that fast dollar not, or fast nickel, not that slow dime, you know. <laughs> I, want, I want instant gratification. I want it now. And those definitely weren't my crowd. They were way too laid back for me. <laughs> and I, I used to smoke pot. And so, you know, that's not something good you want to do. You don't want to sell something that you like to do. And so I stopped doing that, and a friend of mine um, was like, I called her to see if she knew where I could get any, we called it caca or peanut butter, and I needed to sell that. And she's like, no, they don't even have that anymore. That good shit's gone. It was crank. I said, well, what about red and black? And she's like, it's very rare. She said, now they have ice. I said, well, that's stupid. And she said, yeah, I know. But that, I said, what does it even look like? Shards of glass. And I'm like, can I make any money off of it? Yeah, you can. A lot? Yeah, a lot. And I'm like, OK, it's right up my alley. So I started selling 
meth, but ice. And um, I did make a lot, I made a lot of money. Did a lot of really stupid things making that money. Um, and I started doing it because meth was my drug of choice. And I lost myself. <laughs> I got caught up in the money and, you know, scared money don't make money. <laughs> and so in my head, that means you take all of your investments, all your profit, and you invest and flip, invest and flip. And that's what I did. You know, I made sure that my kids had everything that they needed. My boys, but they didn't have me. I sent them to stay with my sister a lot. And then finally I realized that my son was almost 10, my oldest son. I knew I didn't want to stay in this life forever. And when Billy was about to turn 10 years old, I was like, what the are you doing? He's going to do what you're doing when he grows up. He's going to think it's cool you're glorifying this lifestyle. What are you doing to them? You're lost. And I said, Billy, you gotta, you're going to have to stay with your dad for a little bit. Because I knew I wanted to quit, but... You know, I'm on the verge of losing my apartment. I'm about to, you know, I'm running from the police. Every time they try to pull me over, I'm taken off, you know, and I can't do that with my kids, you know, and that's not a safe lifestyle. I'm not around safe people. No one was ever allowed to come to my house. But it wasn't smart, and I knew it wasn't smart, and I knew that... He's a mama's boy, and he would be 100% ready to do whatever his mother was doing. And so I called his dad. It was him and Nick. I didn't think Nick's dad would let me have him back. And so I called Billy, and I said, I need, I need to know that if I send little Billy with you, you won't keep him from me. And you won't let anybody be mean to him. And I can see him, and I can have him back when I get my life back. No, I promise. I said, don't, don't let him know what I'm doing, because he doesn't know. He knows I have money. He thinks it's from my friends that owe me money that I loan them. I had already stopped working at Waffle House. I don't know why he thought I had money for no reason, but he was nine, so I could do no wrong, you know? Nick was four. Billy was about to turn 10. So Nick really didn't know what was going on. I thought, you know, in my head, he didn't. And so, um, he went with his dad, and then he came. His dad lied when he said he wouldn't keep him from me because he did it for the right reasons. You know, I wasn't together, but I would track him down like a bloodhound. That's my baby. You're not, I'm his mom. I might be a fuck up, but I'm his mom. He needs to know that I love him. He said, like, well, if you love him, get your shit together. You know, and I'm like, well, I'm trying. Is this really hard? I wasn't trying, you know, I wasn't. I tell myself I was trying, but you get caught up in that life and you start to love the lifestyle, the adrenaline rush you get from running from a cop, you know, that's... One day, um, I had both the boys over at my uncle Bo's house. He was staying with his friend. And so we were staying there, Max and I. 
we met each other again. We knew each other since school, like kindergarten, first grade. And then we reconnected through drugs. And uh, I was with his brother. And his brother sent me to go and get Max. His brother's in jail. And I go get Max. And instantly, my grandma told me a long time ago, you see those boys, you don't ever, ever talk to them. Those are bad boys. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't. But really, I was like, <laughs> can't wait till I, yeah, they're cool. You know, long rat tail, you know, back in the 90s, 80s, and he was really cool. Starter jacket, he was a cool guy. Out of my league. <laughs> But, you know, we reconnected and we instantly had chemistry. I didn't break that, you know what? And then he was there helping me with my boys, you know, and we both would talk, we don't want to do this, you know, we don't want to do this. Well, You know, we thought, oh, we're going to straighten our lives out. We ended up being together. His brother's in jail. He's never going to get out. I wasn't worried about it. Didn't really like him. I just had a boyfriend in jail, so I didn't have to worry about having one out. You know, that would just clog up the plans, the money plans that I had. And it was easier to have one away, out of sight, out of mind, and know that I had things to do. And then Max and I ended up together. And that was a hell of a journey, the first part. I mean, we we had a hell of a ride. We were always, always together to the point of obsession, probably. And I'm sure the drugs had a real big part of that. And then you get to a point where you're like, what if it's just the drugs? You know, what if I don't even like you? And what if you don't even like me? It could just be we're high and we like what we're doing, you know? We like the way we are. What if we don't even like each other sober? That's not the life I want. And I would still talk to him about, you know, God and things like that because that's, I have a very strong faith background and I was raised in church and so is he. You know, he had to go to Catholic school and things like that. And so we had a connection there, too. And I'd tell him, you know, I, he'd say, well, why do you always want to talk about God when you're high? And I'm like, because I talk about him when I'm not high, you know. And you take him to the gutter of the guts. He don't leave you, you know. And he used a lot of alcoholics and prostitutes and things like that. And so he loves us. You know, we just got to love ourselves to realize that he does. Max would talk, him and his buddies would have church. You know, they'd sit there and talk about the Bible and look up verses and stuff like that. Well, and then this one time we go and we stay at my Uncle Bo's house. And by this time I had a warrant for my arrest. It was for a traffic violation that I got, um, when I was working at Waffle House, my mom's big thing whenever she was doing bad, you know, she had all these nice ass cars, really nice. But she worked at Waffle House and she's like, I got to show these kids that you can do it without selling drugs. You can do it without doing that. And so she did and she busted her butt at work and she bought a nice, nice truck. You know, she always had nice vehicles. And when she did that, she uh, souped it up, you know, rims, tinted windows. I really liked to be, I liked the loud radios and the rims, blacked out windows. You know, my sisters and brothers are still really into cars and things like that. They're good. They don't do bad things, but they're really into things like that still. And um, so I had this nice Caprice, and it had blue paint job on it, a white top, and blacked out windows, and I had a 
whole stereo system. I'd pop my Momo off. That was my steering wheel and take it, you know, everywhere I went because you can't steal a car if you ain't got the steering wheel right. <laughs> I had lost all of that, you know, once I started selling drugs and stuff. But I got a ticket for not stopping all the way at a stop sign and I got it while my grandma was alive and it, I got it paid all the way down to $10. And then when she died, I didn't care. And I didn't go pay the $10. And so every time you get a ticket, you know, you miss court date, that fine doubles and doubles and doubles. And well, it doubled enough to where I was gonna get in trouble, you know, and um, I had every intention on paying it. I just never did. And then um, it's the thought that counts, right? <laughs> I thought about paying. And then we we're over here at my um, Uncle Bo's house, and uh, my bonds woman was a friend of my grandma's. And she's like, I don't know what the hell you're doing with your life, but you better pump the brakes, little girl. I'm like, oh, I'm fine. I'm not doing anything with my life. And she's like, yeah, that's just it. And so um, she was looking for me. She knew where I was. You know, she wasn't really looking for me. But finally, she was like, enough's enough. I feel, you know, kind of like I spit in her face because she was practically family. And uh, they surrounded the house, blocked off a few streets. I was in the bathroom. The kids were across the street playing, Billy and Nick. So I took that opportunity to go in the bathroom and smoke some meth. And um, I hear people outside, and I'm like, Max, I hear police radios. He's like, you're tripping. I'm like, no, I'm not. You know, I know what I hear. Well, and they were out there. The boys, you know, came in, and they were like, Mom, there's cops everywhere. What's going on? And I'm like, I don't know. It's okay. So I called my mom. I said, hey, mom, they're here for me. My mom was sick. She had cancer. I said, they're here for me. Uh, I don't know. Stupid traffic ticket. And the boys are here. And I'm not going out of this house until my kids are with you. So you have to get here. And she's like, I don't have a ride right now. You know, I'm, I don't feel good, but I'm gonna try to get there. So she called my sister, Chrissy, and she came. And my sister, Minka, she came. My mom came with my baby sister, Raquel. And my boys, I didn't, she let me hug them. The Bonds woman let me hug them. My sister was there and she's like, take Max to jail too, he's a piece of shit and he's probably in the house. <laughs> and I'm like, shut up, Chrissy, no he's not. What is wrong with you, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm tired of this. And I'm like, I don't care, like, <laughs> whatever. And so they took me in cuffs and they were like, why were you in the house so long? I said, cause you waiting on my mom for my kids. And so I hope you're not gonna like get me in trouble for that too because I'm a mom above everything. I might be a bad mom, but I'm still a mom. And so I took the kids and gave them a hug and told them I love them and told them I'll be right back. You know, I'll figure it out. I'll be home soon. You're gonna go with mom. They called me mama, all my kids do, and they call our mom mom because there's so many of us calling her that and I said you're gonna go with mom for a little bit and I'll be home soon well um it was a whole 13 days it was the longest I ever went to jail it was 13 days it's a real long time right <laughs> but I saw my sons running up to that car and I thought, you know, I'm never going to touch anything again. This broke them. It hurt them. 
And so I got out and I had all intentions of being good. I called my mom because I went to my uncle's house because she had moved in between. She was in the process of moving and I couldn't remember where her new house was. And so I called her and I was like, Mom, I'm out. And she was trying to explain to me that she was two blocks away and how to get there. And I just didn't get it. I didn't understand. And she's like, I'm walking. I'm walking there. My mom had nephrostomy tubes to drain the urine off of her kidneys. She come running up and hugging me. Told me she loves me. Don't ever do this shit again. I'm like, I won't, won't promise. I said, you gotta help me get Nick. Cause in that 13 days, my mom was sick. It was a lot for me to put on her. Billy went with his dad. Nick ended up with his dad. And Nick's dad was like, no, you're gonna fuck up again. I'm not letting you have him. And I'm like, you can't do that to me because I don't know if I can live without them. They're my whole reason. He said, you promise you're not doing this again? I said, yeah, I promise. Bring, bring me my baby, I gotta see him. I knew once I saw him, I wasn't giving him back whether he wanted to try to take him or not. You know, it wasn't happening. So I stay, you know, clean for a little bit, but it's really hard to be sober when your partner isn't. And I knew that if I didn't straighten my shit out, he was never gonna straighten his out. And I could see real fast that he was gonna, he wasn't gonna be here much longer if he didn't. And my mom started getting sicker and sicker. And me and Max were just infatuated with each other, like, I couldn't breathe without him. He couldn't breathe without me. And it was like, one of us had to be the strong one here because it's not gonna be him, it's not. And so my mom calls me and she's like, Amber, uh, you gotta straighten your life out. I'm dying. And I said, no, you're not. You're stupid. You just say dumb shit. You know, you can't say stuff like that to me, mom. And she's like, well, it's a reality and I need you to accept it. But I don't know when it's gonna happen, but it's gonna happen. And I'm like, okay, I'll try. And started selling dope again, cause you know, and now I need money, my mom's gonna die. Me and Max were just constantly in the streets, you know, doing dumb stuff. And I ended up, uh, he ended up going to jail. I got real sick, like sick. Couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. My mom said, I think you're pregnant. I said, I think you're tripping. And she was like, no. Something's going on with you and you need to go get checked out. And I was like, I'll just take a pregnancy test so you can shut up. Like, I'm not. Stop saying that. And she, you know, I had an IUD and I had it removed. And, you know, you're not supposed to be able to get pregnant right afterwards. And, you know, I'd had it in for 10 years. I get it removed and I go to the doctor, you know, while he's in jail. And they're like, well, you're pregnant. You're only a week, maybe a week and a half pregnant, but yeah. And so I had just re-upped. I called up my Uncle Louie and you know, I, I was high cause I knew I wasn't pregnant, you know. I called up my Uncle Louie and I said, you need to come and get all of this, everything. And if you ever see me touch anything again, you need to beat the shit out of me, you know, cause I'm gonna lose myself in this. And I need to be sober when Max gets out or we're not, we're not gonna make it. I don't even know if these babies are gonna make it because you know, I'm, I was getting high, you know? And he's like, it's only a weekend. You're doing the right thing. And 
I was like, I have to, I have to do this. And Max calls from home and I'm like, hey, I'm done doing drugs. I don't think me and you are ever going to get our shit together if one of us don't stop. And he's like, yeah, you're probably right. I don't want to live that life anymore either. I said, okay, well, here we go. We're going to stop. I'm done. I called my uncle. I asked him to come get everything and get rid of it, get it out of my face, and keep everybody away from me. I don't want anybody around me. And my uncle came, and he, you know, had to mess with me a little bit. Like, you sure? You sure, sure? Because, you know, now you're, you're in debt, booger. And I was like, yeah, I know. But I don't care. Burn every bridge so I can't go back across it. And he says, okay, burn it. And I was like, all right, I'm done. And whenever I told Max, you know, I had my uncle come and get all my stuff. And I don't ever want to touch it again. We had to be sober or we're not going to work. And he's like, okay. And he got out and, you know, he relapsed a few times. And he had a wild ride, you know, and I'm sober and I'm... Oh my God, I remember being huge and pregnant with the twins and my mom would hide Max from me because she <laughs> knew that I was crazy. And Monica, his sister, was like, I need my brother, she was a stripper, I need my brother to come guard, you know, make sure nobody hurts me or anything. And I'm like, well, that's weird, no. And she's like, he's my brother, it's not weird. I'm like, it's a little weird. Uh, and so I didn't want him to go because I, I was trying, fighting so hard to keep him sober. And we lived, my mom lived in the third floor of the apartments. I lived in the bottom floor. And when I tell you I was really pregnant with the twins, I was really pregnant. I mean, Max would have to carry my belly behind me. I broke a toilet. I was so pregnant, like it was, it was bad. And I, he went upstairs, I'm gonna go talk to your mom. And my mom said, he's getting ready to leave. Just stay down there, let him go. So I grabbed a knife, cause he ain't leaving. What? He'll leave, but he ain't leaving the way he wants to. And I ran up three flights of stairs. In my head, I was running. I don't really know how that happened. I was huge. And my mom said, he jumped out of the fire escape. I was like, what? I hope he broke his leg. And she's like, well, he didn't because he kept going. <laughs> so, you know, that fight for, you know, his sobriety and his life, because I knew he's who I'm supposed to be with, you know, and I feel that in my soul, you know. And so it would be easy for me to have these babies and just go again. And... I wanted them to have him as a dad. I wanted him to be there because I saw how much he loved his daughters and his other two kids. And even though he didn't get to see them, and I just, he loved Nicholas and Billy like his own. We were messed up, you know, but he really loved my kids. And I wanted my twins to be able to have that. Finally, you know, we get to a point where he he's sober. And, you know, we do, we have the best life, it felt like. You know, everything was good. And I stayed sober. I haven't touched drugs again since I had my uncle pick them up. And, you know, it was a, it was a little longer for him to get there. But he got there. And now for the last, well... 11 years for me, I think. I don't know, because I think if you try to remember your sobriety date, I think that in my head, you know, some people it might work different, but in my head, I would be dwelling on it, and it might trigger me to do it again. He doesn't know his sobriety date because he doesn't pay attention to things like that either. But we're sober, and the way we did that was... Um, I told him I'm taking the kids and I'm moving to Chillicothe away from all of this. You either go or you don't go. And I gave him two weeks, you know, to 
get all that out of his system. And he's like, I don't know, it scares me. You know, it scares me to stop because I don't know who I am without this. And I'm like, well, I know who you are. I see it and I want you to see it. And so I just got in the car. Wasn't a very nice getting ready to leave. Flipped out on his mom. Uh, and I got in the car and loaded up the kids and I said, I'm gone. This is your final chance. And he's like, fine, I'll leave it all. You know, well, good, let's go. And we went out to Chillicothe. We started our lives over. We had, he had a few struggles here and there, but we found a good church that we went to and got the kids back in church and all of our kids ended up living with us and we had Kaylee, we had Becca, Billy, Nick, Mary, Frankie, and then end up pregnant with Chevy. And life is great, you know, and then we moved a little further out to Brookfield, Missouri. The kids loved it there, it's so rural. I really miss it. And so does he and so do the kids and, you know, it was, kind of harder to find a church there that we felt wasn't judgy because he's covered in tattoos and I have tattoos but they're hidden you know <laughs> so you kind of feel judged some places you go you know and so um, it was a little harder for us to do that but I got really involved in community um, Girl Scouts the girls making sure that the boys had everything you know that they wanted to be involved in because I did mess up so much of their life I wanted to fix it they got real involved in sports and made a lot of friends and it was the life that I saw and that I had when I was younger and and now we finally did it you know we finally did that and then we ended up out here in Topeka. Billy moved out here. He got a job, at our, my oldest son. Kaylee and Becca would go back and forth between our house and their mom's house. And uh, it was crazy. You know, it was a wild one hell of a ride, I'll say that. But. Through all of it, God pulled us through it. He never left us because if he did, there's so many circumstances that neither one of us would be here. A lot of people in addiction lose their kids, you know, and that breaks my heart because your kids are always on your mind whether you're high or you're not, you know, and you just don't want to go around them like that. You can't love yourself enough to get out of it makes it a lot harder to be there for your kids and then you feel like you don't even love your kids enough like you're a piece of shit you can't even love your kids enough to straighten your life out like who are you but then when you do when you finally realize that you are enough and you're perfect the way that God made you and nothing at all can tear you away from that. And everybody makes mistakes. Everybody does. And it's just where you go from there. You know, you can you can bounce up and down and back and forth and none of that matters because the goal, if you keep your eye on the prize, you're gonna get it. You know, in the end, you're gonna get it. And that's where we're at now. I mean, We busted our butts to get here, but now we have our family and we've done really good things for our community and we raise our kids in church. And I'm a Sunday school teacher, I'm a cussy one apparently, <laughs> but I work in the nursery at our church, um, kindergarten or birth to kindergarten and I get to teach them a Sunday school lesson every Sunday and my kids go down and they're very involved in church and 
Yeah, and so was Max. So, dun da da. -da. <laughs> Kept my eye on the prize and it was a hell of a ride, but here we are. And I've never talked about my addiction out loud. That was weird. Never done that. Never talked to anybody about it because I just keep it hidden because people look at you weird. Was I looking at you weird? No. Yeah, I was. You might have been. <laughs> no.